Hey everyone, welcome to the Sword and Laser episode number 145. I'm Veronica Belmont. And I'm the book year zero. No, I'm not. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm Tom Merritt. But uh, we are going to have the author of the book year zero on the show with us today, Mr. Rob Reed. Hello. Yes, and- Indeed, and hopefully some of you are joining us for this live Google Hangout right now. Of course, if you're not, don't worry. You can also listen to it as a podcast over at swordandlaser.com. Uh, but let's jump right into things. Rob, thank you so much for being back on the show. Thank you for having me. It's great to be back. What have you been up to lately? Um, a little bit of travel, um, a lot of email, a little bit of writing. Um, we're working on a movie deal, which is kind of exciting. Ooh. And... Uh, a bit of tweeting. So, you know, all of the major food groups. That's good. Any any drinking? Uh, yes, actually. I understand that that's an important part of the tradition here at Sword and Laser. So I did bring a drink. Um, it is uh, a glass of bourbon. Hmm, and it's nice. uh, rather fun bourbon. It is called uh, Willet's Pot Reserve. And I guess the pot is a reference to the funny shape of the bottle. Ah, or it's pot like a, still, yeah. Aladdin's so it, lamp of bourbon. It, it is. It's like you rub it in the bourbon genies come come <laughs> flying out, and it, it's uh you can't get it in California, so I had to get huh. it through. Um, there's a website called Caskers.com, like Caskers, I guess mm-hmm. Cask plus ERS, and uh, it's about thirty to forty bucks a bottle. And um, I had it when I was in Connecticut visiting with family and it's like really fun. It's a little spicy. It's got some honey kind of notes to it. Um, it tastes like a really, really fancy bourbon and at 30 something, 30 to 40 bucks, that's a good deal. Wait yeah. a second. Do we have do we have a Connecticut connection that I don't know about or did we talk about this before on previous I don't episodes? Know. Are you from Connecticut? I am. I am too. Where are you from? I'm from the town of Darien and yourself? I am from West Hartford. How about that? Well, my family retired, my, my parents retired to the northwest corner, and so they're not all that far from West Hartford. They're in a town called Falls Village, uh, which is uh, three-ish miles from both Massachusetts and New York, so extreme upper left corner oh, there. Oh, yeah, it's way up there. And uh, we fly in and out of Hartford when we're going there, so yeah, small world and very small state. <laughs> and small state and very, very small, small state small. as well, yes. Very small state. Well, I am also drinking some bourbon today. I'm drinking Bullet. Whoa. Cheers. Um, Cheers. So I've got my giant... Memo. My giant ice cube. I know I didn't. I don't. Yeah, I don't normally have um, hard alcohol during the show, but it felt like one of those kinds of days. Oh, I like the. Are you guys seeing that zoom effect? Yeah. Like, like Very nice. Micro. Ultra zoom. Yeah, ultra zoom effect. Oh, and by the way, um, since we are live, we can also take questions from the audience. So if any of you, like five people who are watching, <laughs> want to ask a question <laughs> to Rob Reed, uh, feel free to do so. We have the app installed, so uh, we can take your questions live. Very good. Are you guys done talking about bourbon and, and Connecticut? Yeah. I'll, I I'll, I'm from Illinois and all I have is a beer. That's all right. But it's a very good beer. That's a Racer 5. It is. Five. Racer 5. Racer 5 IPA. One of my favorites. I've had it before on Sword and Laser. It's an oldie but a goodie. Good. And uh, um, yeah. Well, you've had me before on Sword and Laser I have, as well. I have so. great bourbon too. I just didn't even think. I should have. You should have read our minds and known automatically that we were going to be drinking well, bourbon tonight. I knew Rob was going to because he said, I guess I was thinking, well, I don't want to imitate. But then he didn't tell you that. so you. And, great you know. minds think alike. Yeah, what that's can I true. Say? <laughs> great so, minds Rob, drink alike. Hey. Yes, uh, that's even better. Uh, so you wrote a great blog post today um, that we wanted to bring up. And uh, so your, your book, Year Zero, is going to be um, offered for 99 cents. It is currently being offered for 99 cents. Couple caveats: A, ebook only, and B, United States only. Oh, okay. um, but Random House is doing uh, a very aggressive uh, promotion of uncertain duration. I'd say it's probably going to be several days, which is obviously a vague term, but I don't actually know how long it's going to be. And they're doing it to basically drive awareness of the book. Um, at ninety-nine cents, it will hopefully, thanks to the magic of price elasticity. Uh, reach more readers than it would have otherwise. And I think, you know, because the paperback just came out a few months ago, probably they're trying to drive awareness of that going into the holiday season, but I'm kind of speculating now. Oh, so, what, what part are you speculating about? The holiday season paperback connection. I mean, the other possible interpretation is one that I prefer not to contemplate, which is that they printed far too many digital copies of the book and they're sitting in a bonded hard drive someplace <laughs> and they're worried that the moths are going to get to them and they're like, let's just drop it to 99 cents and move these things. But fire you know, the, sale, fire sale. The first sale. ever remaindered fire e-book. Sale. Yeah. 
Yeah, but you know, something about that, and I can't put my finger on it, doesn't mm. quite seem right. So I'm just sort of guessing at the promote the paperback, but you know what? I want as many people as possible to read this thing, and um, I wrote it for fun. I thought I was going to self-publish it, so I never expected to make a dime. Uh, I hope lots and lots and lots of people buy it for cheap, which they can do right now. Now, we have uh, a couple other questions about the sale, but before we get to those, tell mm -hmm. folks who haven't heard what the book is about. Well, uh, Year Zero uh, concerns in an all-too-likely, all-too-plausible scenario uh, for our first encounter with intelligent life, uh, which is that a vast alien civilization um, has encountered our broadcasts and through them has fallen so fervently in love with the pop music of the year 1977, which is the first broadcast that they picked up, that basically they dropped everything that they were doing and listened enraptured to American pop music and foreign pop music as well for a period of decades. And when they finally snapped out of this ecstatic trance, because we do make the best music in the universe, key premise, when they finally snapped out of this trance, they realized uh, that they owed us an ungodly amount of money because they had inadvertently committed the biggest copyright infringement since the dawn of time. Mm -hmm. And basically okay. all the wealth in the universe is owed to us. And particularly our pop singers and their record labels and music publishers and so forth. And then hilarity hopefully ensues if you find that kind of thing funny. I, I, I don't know if I, I can't remember right now if I had read it the last time we interviewed you. Um, I, I may have uh, actually listened to the audiobook, which is, of course, narrated by John Hodgman, who is one of my favorite comedians slash actors slash people in the universe. And so I think, yeah, I think that added like another layer of hilarity to the whole thing. And I just love how the aliens react to the music because it is so, it's almost like orgasmic. Like, I don't know how else to describe it, like their feelings towards our pop music. And I, I think that's a really, it was a really cute and clever and very funny way to kind of build that universe out. Well, it's, it's, like, it's like that. It's like orgasmic in that it's very physical, but it's also like very philosophical. It's this extraordinary aesthetic appreciation that our own minds, even as the creators of the music, are too puny and underpowered to really, you know, fully process. Um, but yes, they, they sure like our music, and it definitely causes problems because of the nature of copyright law. And uh, it, lest people think that your book is so self-congratulatory for the human race, we're kind of depicted as rubes in pretty much every other aspect, right? Pretty much dunderheads and everything else. And so basically the, the alien civilization, which is called the Refined League, um, have 40 of what they call noble arts. And it turns out that we are just dunderheads in 39 of them. And they're things like, you know, what you'd expect. Stained glass, synchronized swimming, that kind of thing. <laughs> of We're course. really, really bad at all of these things. But we have this mad genius when it comes to music. And there are a few sort of evolutionary reasons that are laid out in the second paragraph of the book that you know, allows anybody to sort of check the box and say, okay, you've explained it, I'll suspend my disbelief. But basically, we start with that precept that our music is just simply by far and away the greatest music that the universe has ever produced. And these aliens who are so advanced that they're no longer really engaged in economic or technical pursuits. They've mastered technology to the greatest degree possible. They've created enormous abundance. They spend their entire lives consuming and connecting with and adoring great art. And music is the greatest art of all in their view. And to their horror, these sort of dunderheads, which is humanity, makes this mind-blowingly great music. Not their horror, but it's a little bit aggravating that people who are so déclassé otherwise are making the greatest music in the universe, but they get over that because it's great music. Yeah. Now, of course, you are the founder of the company that went on to create Rhapsody, and so I you am. have some experience with, with uh, music and with IP. And our first question from the audience actually comes from William Brine on YouTube. He wants to know, uh, well, first of all, he paid full price for the book, and he's totally okay with that. Uh, and he said, love the playlist, want to see more authors do that. So my question, your commentary at the end was great, so what do you think will solve our, our IP woes, and are we moving in the right direction or in the wrong direction? Now, let's see. I don't know if he's talking about our intergalactic IP woes, which are significant, uh, or our planetary IP woes, which are... Uh, I'm going to go with the second one, though. 
Um, so yeah, I mean, I, we're in a we're in a very very difficult state of transition because there were a lot of things about the creative process and the way that it got curated and the way that it got distributed and the way that it got compensated that were essentially artifacts of physical distribution and you know there was no way of knowing that at the time but all of a sudden when all those intermediators of physical distribution disappear it becomes very very easy to pirate obviously um, a lot of uh, the curators like bookstores and radio stations and so forth are in very very diminished roles um, you can get a lot of people out there who are writing or creating for completely non-economic reasons like myself I never expected to sell a single copy of this book who suddenly can plug into this international distribution system and maybe write their own rules in terms of you know whether they even want to have copyright and so forth so everything is an enormous flux right now and I think that as is the case with so many industries that are moving into the digital age there's just a couple decades of confusion and mayhem and tumult as people figure out how we're going to deal with this. Um, the problem that we have in the United States, in my view, and it's not just in this political issue, it's it's probably in almost all political issues, is that, you know, particularly I'll talk about music right now, because that's what concerns a lot of what goes on in the book. The beneficiaries from incredibly lopsided and incredibly ham-fisted laws that got baked in the books over a period of many decades um, were so well organized and had so much to gain from irrational law being written that they could swarm Congress and they could swarm the Judiciary Committees and they could swarm basically the corridors of power making their point and those of us who had a meager and very very almost hypothetical benefit to be had from you know things like the Creative Commons I'm talking about that in the generic sense not the the precise sense that it now means with Mr. Lessig's laws and so or, or, or um, uh, organization and so forth things like that were so unorganized um, and had so little to gain on an individual by individual basis that the thumb really got put on the scale in a big way. Um, <clears throat> to his question, are we going to come out of this? I think that we are because I think that the digital citizenry is getting much better organized right now and things like this, the, the protests that turned around that stopped the SOPA law from being passed have shown that people are starting to understand that they have a strong vested interest here. Also the fact that people can organize so easily online um, is another major mitigating factor. But I think it's going to continue to be a very, very choppy process. My hope is that at the end of the day, we've, we've got all these things that digital distribution enhances. It can be a lot less expensive, obviously, to get a title to somebody when it doesn't have to take physical form. You can get a much, much greater diversity of music, books, etc., out to the world when it doesn't have to go to a, through a physical channel. My hope is that the benefits that come from this digital transition will accrue to readers and writers or musicians and listeners and also the curators alike in some kind of just and co-equal form because I think we need all three clearly we need to have you know consumers of content and clearly we need to have creators of content who can be paid to do what they do or they're not going to be able to do it full time and I actually think the roles of folks like publishers and music labels is also incredibly vital and it would be tragic if they got disintermedi disintermediated to a degree that they were no longer there to play their own role. Now it, it's interesting too because you kind of talk a little bit about this in your blog post but it, it seems very interesting that both you know a lot of mp3s have been sold at the 99 cent price point and now your book mm -hmm. is also being sold at the 99 cent price point. Is this what we are valuing digital content at these days or, or do you think it's going to go along those lines or or is that just you know, a, a coincidence. Um, oh, I, not, I don't think there's, I think 99 cents has been a magic price in the human mind since we started counting and realized that we had 10 fingers. There's just sort of like a gravitational pull to the big round numbers and as soon as everybody realizes that there's something magic about 1 in 10, along comes a marketer who says chop one penny off and it sounds like a lot less money. So I don't, I think, think, I think the 99-ness is just sort of a relic of base 10 math and you know it's something that we see out in the physical world and so forth you know in terms of are we you know, one of the things that I talked about and maybe you're alluding to in, in my blog post is the music industry for many years 
was so resistant to releasing, or at least the major labels were, releasing their titles online because they were, they were almost morally offended by the notion that a song could be purchased for a dollar. They said that would quote-unquote devalue music as if the only way to honor uh, a, a, a good song was to glue it to a dozen and a half so-so songs and sell it you know, for $16 in the form of a CD. What I like about publishing is that they're, they haven't ever taken that perspective. And the publishing industry, even giant publishers like my publisher, Random House, have been really, really aggressive and experimental, what they've done with pricing. And so, yeah, to sell a book that came out in paperback a few months ago for 99 cents when the paperback list is, you know, 15, would seem like crazy pricing. And it's certainly the kind of thing that the music labels would never have even contemplated during this long period when they were embargoing all major label music from the, the online music stores like Rhapsody, who were obviously trying very hard to sell it and to license it. And I, I think that the absence of experimentation on their part was one of the reasons we got so much piracy. And I love the fact that my book's available for 99 cents. I think we're going to reach thousands and you know maybe even tens of thousands of readers who wouldn't have gambled ten dollars on a first-time author that they wouldn't you know they hadn't heard of before and only put one work out and so I think it's really a phenomenal way to drive audience and drive awareness and so forth and I'm thrilled that they're doing it go ahead Tom <laughs> uh, you, you you probably are surprising some people when you say that you know the music industry was crazy and you know we need a we need to have creators empowered and then you say i think there's a place for publishers and even record labels yeah. uh, but you wrote in your blog post today building a big audience for self published books would require ghoulish levels of social media stamina that i lack what do you think that role is for for publishers and record labels uh, and 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 where do you think their role fits? It would, will it always be there, or with people who love to do the twitters, uh, be able to get around them? Oh, I think that one of the great things about the time that we're in right now is that there, all options are on the table, particularly for writers. Less so for music artists, and less so for bands. And I'll talk about that in a second. Um, but yeah, people who have ghoulish or gowlish, however you say it. I just know how to write words. I don't know how to say them. Oh, me too. Uh, I only know how to read them. I don't know how to say them either. Yeah, I, I miss... There's so many words that I, to this day, mispronounce. Like, did you know it's glower and not glower? I didn't know that until... I, I knew that one. I didn't know that one until very, very recently. And I've used it in two different books. And when I mispronounced it in a reading and somebody politely told me afterward... Anyway, um, <laughs> when I say gowlish levels of social media stamina, I say it with the deepest respect. I don't have it. Um, but those who do, those people who are really, really good connectors on Twitter and through blogging and through Facebook and all the other mechanisms that are out there, I think at this point, you know, having a publisher is entirely optional for such a person. And there are many, many entirely self-published wor works that are in the top 10, top 50, top 100 titles in the Kindle store. I think that's amazing and really really empowering for people who have those kinds of chops and that kind of stamina. Um, I thought I was going to self-publish this book because I thought the topic was too weird for anybody but me or Larry Lessig to actually be interested in it. And so I did a lot of research into that. I was kind of excited about it but also kind of dreading it. And I think in retrospect, I mean in retrospect I'm very very happy I ended up with a publisher because the reality is every hour that you spend you know, tangling with the myriad details that would inevitably come with self-publishing um, is an hour you're not going to spend writing. Hmm. And I really, one thing I learned from this exercise, I'd written two business books previously, this was my first novel, I really like fiction and I want to spend as much time as possible writing fiction in the future. And to the degree that an editor and, well not really an editor, publishing house can take care of a lot of the details pertaining to pricing decisions, distribution, a certain level of publicity and so forth, that frees me up to write and I find that empowering and incredibly valuable. But I do think that a really good self-starting you know, social media maven of a writer could not only succeed but probably make a lot more money um, going directly if they so choose. And, and the beauty is both options are there. Um, in terms of the role that publishers play, I do think that th this role of curation is going to continue to matter. Um, when anything, absolutely anything of any level of quality can 
exist with co-equal distribution, which to be clear is one of the, probably the single most awesome and fabulous and empowering and important things about the internet. So I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but when that happens, it becomes all the more important for people to be able to be to, to navigate the incredible range of what's out there. There's a lot of curators out there. It's not just publishers and editors. It's people like you who decide what books you're going to feature and what books you're not. It's you know blogs like Boing Boing. I mean, there's a lot of intermediaries out there. But I do think that the publishers being wholly focused on curating and assembling and helping to edit, et cetera, books are definitely going to have an important and vibrant role for many, many years to come. You know, when you explain it like that, it sounds like art, the way we think of, of paintings and sculptures, where anybody can do it. You don't need a publisher to provide the granite or the canvas or the paint for you, right? It's the same thing. Anybody can do it, but not everybody is going to be good at it, and galleries uh, are curators. And they, yeah. they say, these are the good pieces. And then if somebody makes a name for themselves, self-published, then they can open their own galleries with their own works, mm -hmm. etc. Do you think that if it gets to a point where someone's well-known enough, somebody who's a heritage writer who's been with a publisher, that there's sort of this other side they can go out on and be self-published at the end of the road, so to speak? I, yeah, and I think that I have to assume that that is an overwhelming temptation for writers who have developed enormous names um, over the decades. You know, um, without any question, I mean, if, you know, if a writer who regularly got bestsellers on the New York Times list they would not have to exert anywhere near the energy of a new writer to create an economically viable model online because they've already got a readership. Um, the reviewers who are widely read are going to be attuned to the fact that their book has come out and they can keep 70% of every dollar that they make selling their product through Amazon and the other ebook stores and they can also keep a much, much higher proportion of physical books um, particularly if they decide to do on-demand distribution. Now, the, the place where it would fall down for them would be book, bookstore distribution. And there's also the other trick that they'll face, I think, is going to be a feeling of a lot of allegiance to the system that they grew up in and that you know they benefited from a great deal. And I do know the books, I think bookstores are going to matter for a very, very long time. I do not think that they're going to go the way of music stores and almost wholly disappear. And I think that the bookstores uh, take great umbrage to people who completely exit the system and try to go strictly online uh, or try to go strictly digital. And so I think that's a really, really important channel that people who bail on the system entirely will lose access to. I mean, the, basically, the bookstores mm. did that to Tim Ferriss with his last book. That's a good point. Um, we actually, I think we answered our next question uh, from from Marcius, who wanted to know what's the best way to go, self-publishing or going through a publishing company. And I guess it all just kind of depends on on your situation. The answer is yes. Um, and I would say that the more the newer and less known you are, uh, the more it behooves you to go through a publishing house if you can. Um, I think that there's a degree of credibility that they offer. I think there's a degree of visibility that goes far, far, far beyond what an unknown first writer can achieve. Now, it's a little bit different if, if somebody's already a giant online celebrity or a celebrity of another stripe uh, for reasons other than writing. I think they can probably certainly use their platform to get their work out there, and that would be a different thing. But I'd say if, if, if like me, you're an unknown nobody, um, I think publishers still make a great deal of sense. Well, what you, you're far from an unknown nobody. Yeah, I think. unknown somebody. A little know. modest. Yeah, but what what about somebody who can't seem to get noticed? And let's assume, for the sake of the argument, that it's not because they're a horrible writer. Uh, yeah. There are just so many writers out there. There are good writers who get passed over. Do you think self-publishing can work as a minor leagues? I mean, we've seen this happen with a couple writers like Hugh Howey, for instance, with Wool, where they self-publish, it catches on, and then they get called up to the publishers. Without any question. And then the empowering thing about that is unlike in baseball, when the big leagues finally figure out that you're great and they call you up, if you go that route in self-publishing, you can always deny, refuse the call because you can continue to have this really interesting relationship with your audience. And so that's, again, that gets back to why I think this moment is so great for any type of creator, but particularly writers and, and to a lesser degree musicians. The economics are a little weirder there. I can talk about that later. But it's a really good time for writers because, yeah, it is very, very hard to get published with a major or, or a small publishing house. And back in the day, if you had a pile of rejection letters, 
there wasn't a whole lot else to do unless you made a lot of money and you wanted to go to a physical vanity press and pay a lot of money to get your books in stores, which very few people were in the position to do. So yeah, if somebody does want to be a published author with a, with a traditional publisher and they are unsuccessful in getting a publishing deal, without any question, if they're, if they're mainly in it for the writing, and you really should be because there's not a lot of money to be made here, but if they're really in it for the writing and they're going to be writing passionately and daily, um, absolutely, when they're done with work, they should put it out in the world and see what happens and do their best to draw attention to it. And even if only 25 people read it, that's probably a good 16 or 18 people more who, than who would have read it back in the day when the only way you could get it in somebody's hands was to print it and put it in their hands and know them well enough that they would make an eight-hour investment in your work. So yeah, I mean, get what you've written out there. In fact, I did a lot of writing over the decades um, before I got anything published, and I think I would have found it a lot more thrilling and a lot more rewarding that all that unpublished stuff if I had an audience of dozens, hundreds, thousands, who knows how many people. And again, the beauty is it can grow. It can become thousands and tens of thousands and you could just sit the whole system out. And I think, like I said, I think that can, that can actually pay the bills very nicely. We have another audience question, this one from Gord, who wants to know what are your thoughts on print on demand as the future of physical uh, print books? I think print on demand is really, really interesting. Um, but it doesn't work for physical distribution. Well, it kind of can. I mean, I guess you can put these machines in stores, and there have been some experiments with that, and there were some experiments with it with CDs and music stores back in the day. For some reason, that's never really seemed to catch off dramatically um, or catch on dramatically. I do find print on demand fascinating, though, because a very, very high percentage of physical books are, in fact, sold through the Internet. And you can set up very, very quickly and cleanly and easily in less than 24 hours if you're diligent and you know what you're doing, um, and a, a, a couple of relationships which will, for all intents and purposes, allow your book to appear in Amazon and other bookstores just like any other book. It will say, you know, ships in the next 24 hours. Uh, in the case of Amazon, they'll even ship it via Amazon Prime. And basically, when somebody hits the button and decides that they want to buy that book, it gets created. It either gets created by Amazon themselves, they have a print-on-demand service of their own, or you can get it done through an outside sort service, I think called Lightning Source, which mm -hmm. I think is owned by Ingram that a lot of other people use. So that starts getting really interesting. Not everybody wants eBooks. So if you're just going to be a digital publisher, you're going to sit out a very, very big chunk of the market. Well, if you have a physical book on demand, now you can capture that really, really big part of people who read physical books, but they buy them online. Now you're just missing the bookstores, and the bookstores are very, very important. They're probably about 50% of the market. So I think publishing on demand is really big. But I don't think it's ever going to take the place of bookstores. Um, you can print a print-on-demand book in a bookstore notionally, but it's not going to have the beauty, the eye appeal, the shelf appeal, all those things that bookstore books have, and it's not going to have shelf space by definition. So I don't think it's really going to take over the, the physical store, but I think it, it is definitely a great way to reach a lot of people. I feel like bookstores become showrooms. Uh, I feel like combo new and used bookstores might become the norm instead of the unusual uh, outlier. And and I think I still think that that print on demand aspect becomes the back room. I can get it for you any book you want in an hour in less than an hour. Yeah. Right. You have the showroom with all the books, and somebody says, "Oh, I'm looking for this other one by this author you have, but you don't seem to have it on the shelf." Uh, you, if you just browse around for 30 minutes, ma'am, we'll have it for you. That's an interesting point. Yeah, so that gives people another very, very good reason to go to the physical bookstore because they can get, they don't have to wait a day or two days for Lightning Source to print that. They can get, that's, that's intriguing. I like that idea. You should start a bookstore. Yeah. Yeah. That's the business to get in right now. <laughs> Oh, we just got another uh, audience question. Oh, cool. Uh, this, this one comes from Matthew, who wants to know, so I'm writing a book, and would it be better to just do it by a real store that I can go to or just do it online? I'm not sure which would be better. It sounds like it'd probably be do a real store. I'm not sure I understand the question. I don't either. So I'm writing a book, and would mm -hmm. it be better I'm to do it there. by a real store that I can just go to or just do it online? So I think I think that's another publishing. Is that a self-published versus I think that's a self-published versus. I mean, it kind of sounds like physical versus digital. 
Ah, uh, I see. It's digital. Maybe mm -hmm. that's what they're asking: is should I just sell eBooks, or should I also trouble with like a Lulu.com or a Create Space, or trying to get a publisher so I can get a print version? And hey, yeah, we've been asking that question ourselves recently as well. So this will be beneficial for the Sword and Laser team too. Yeah, I mean. You know, again, it's that mix of things, you know, there, there's that mix of benefits of being independent and being able to call the all, all the shots, but having to do all the promotion and work yourself versus having a publisher. Um, again, I mean, I, I, I think I'd come back to the newer and less known you are, the more benefits there's going to be from working with a publisher. And not merely in terms of visibility and, and distribution and that kind of thing, but you'll learn a lot about, you know, how books are positioned and how they're positioned in the, minds, the, the mind of the public. And, you know, their marketing people are, are really talented. And there's some very, very smart online marketing people at all of the publishers now because they have to be. And I think there's just, there's a great deal to be learned from these organizations that have, have been from time immemorial all about getting books out there. And they are two different mindsets, right? They are. Marketing and, and writing. The... the they don't all, I mean, except for people who write marketing books, I guess, but you know, that. They, they do yes. seem to be two different cultures in a lot of ways. They are, and it, some people are going to be ambidextrous, but it, sure. is, it is two very, very different skill sets, and, you know, let's say there's, <laughs> there's 50 strong skills that people can have to cope with the modern world, and most of us have, you know, are really strong in a dozen of them or something like that. The odds of somebody being really good at writing and also world-class at online marketing it happens. It will happen. But the odds are if you're a great writer, eh, you probably aren't going to draw that other card. You're probably going to be good at something else like making campfires or cars. 300 or, Bowler. Yeah. Yes. 300 right. Bowler. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we got a Goodreads question uh, from Rob. Different Rob, but it involves other me. Robs. Mm. Uh, we were talking about this a little bit before the show. There's a children's book author called Rob Reed, and Very I good. accidentally linked to him when I first created the thread in our Goodreads forum. Uh, Rob would like to know, are you friends with this other Rob Reed? Or is he your nemesis? Uh, or are you, are you alternate universe Rob Reeds? What, what is your relationship? <laughs> that Django was wants to, Sawyer wants to know as well. Sawyer wants to know. Yeah. Um, the other Rob Reed and I um, went to high school together. Um, his name was Jeff Thomas, and um, he we looked very different. And then, uh, basically, when we were juniors, one day he showed up at school with exactly my haircut and wearing precisely the clothes I had worn the previous day. And this sort of like game of chase with the clothing continued all year. He was a very very you know, reserved person, but it was it was kind of creepy. And then it was our senior year. He changed his name to Rob Reed, and then we graduated. And I didn't think I'd see him again. But right when I started writing books, he started writing books as well. But he writes children. No, actually, I don't <laughs> think about the other Rob Reed author. Um, I had noticed that there was another writer who came up um, when you Google Rob Reed author and but it wasn't really until I saw the question about are we nemesises nemesi mm, got you um, thinking that I, I dug into his Goodreads page and yes he's a he's a children's uh, writer and I think that he's refers to himself sometimes as rap and rob mm. uh, but that might be a, yet another rob read but no I don't have any 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 fervent opinions Except for that stuff from high school, but that was so many years ago. I mean, who cares? Yeah, it's, uh, it's all in the past now. All, you said Jeff Thomas? Because I think the weakness in your story is Jeff Thomas is obviously a well-known New Zealand actor. So Why do you even know that? I did a Google. Google search. Oh, because <laughs> you just, Google. just randomly... Okay, gotcha. <laughs> yeah. Clever He's got job. Google Clever. in his brain. I mean, I totally just know that. He's one of the biggest actors home. in all of New Zealand. Right, both islands. Yes. And the minor islands. That's not yeah. saying a lot. Uh, hey so. now. Yeah. Hey, we're from Connecticut. We get to make jokes I know. About some I places. can't. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> and we step all over Rhode Island and yes, Delaware. Yes, thank God for Rhode Island, like right? Like the monsters we are to There's stomp all over those state. lesser states. There's one state. Well, I guess Delaware is smaller too, but who's counting? Okay, I know it's barely even a thing. I mean, it's yeah. a funny joke. Um, so you mentioned that you were working on a movie deal. That is very interesting. I'm sure you cannot speak much to that right now. You know, I'm I assuming. Yeah, but I'm hoping that I'll be able to say quite a bit, perhaps soon. And if I am, maybe I could sneak back onto your show and tell you all about it. That'd, That'd be. be I'm assuming this is a is this year zero affiliated. It is year zero. Okay. Yep, it is year zero related. 
Awesome, not just some uh, some other kind of project. Um, and it's and you, so, Rob Reed, not the other Rob Reed. Not the other oh, Rob Reed. Okay. Well, that's the surprise. No, it's it's me, Rob Reed. <laughs> what the a twist! <laughs> <laughs> um, is there anything else you can tell us uh, that you're working on? Um, what else am I working Writing on? Writing-wise? Yeah, I'm working. Okay, unfortunately, I've been asking all these people, can I talk about this, can I talk about that, and mm. I, I'm repeatedly told no. What I can tell you is I am writing a short story for a very cool anthology that's being put together by two very cool writers, and it's going to include science fiction short stories from other writers. But other than that, I can't say anything. I, I sent them emails saying, hey, guys, can I talk about this on Sword and Laser? And they said, not quite no. yet. Those What's two. So that's matter? the other thing. Those, those two people, I will not mention genders, nationalities, mm. or even species. That, you probably can guess they're humans. But, um, yeah, so there's this really cool anthology that's going to come out at some point in the future. Oh, it's not you ours can't, either. It's, and it's not ours. It's not, you're not doing Robot Army also, are you? No. You're not no, in the no. robot. It's not, ro it's not Robot Army. Okay, because no. that's the anthology that I'm doing, and there's a lot of amazing authors. I feel very humbled and weird to be a part of it. Um, and I was like, wait a second, is Rob also part of the anthology? I have to go look to their website real fast to find out. No. But no, you're not. It's okay. And well, you're you not supposed be. to talk about it either, right? We're bitter, I can talk about it. I'm allowed to talk about rivals. it. We're bitter rivals. We're bitter rivals of Robot Army. No, actually, no. It's, it's, it's so just many, different. So many good anthologies coming out. Uh, so, many, so many anthologies, so little time. Like Sword and Laser. That one's happening too. That's a real thing. Sword and Laser Anthology. Yes. 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 Fantastic. We're yeah. editing it right now. Cool. We sure are. But where can people follow your work online, Rob? Um, I have a newly revived website, which is, or blog, at Reed Rob Reed, R E A D R O B R E I D. I think I've got pretty much every conceivable misspelling redirecting to that URL too, though. Um, and uh, I am tweeting at Rob underscore Reed. R-E-I-D, and then I also have a Facebook author page. And um, I've been a little bit lazy about all three of those things uh, until quite recently, but I'm going to be much better about them now. Nice. All right, well, I guess that about wraps it up for this episode of Sword and Laser. If you guys want to get in touch with us, our website is swordandlaser.com. All of our discussions happen over on goodreads.com, and you can leave us an email at feedback at swordandlaser.com. We'll see you guys next time. Bye. Thanks so much. Bye.